As Flannery O'Connor put it, the essence of Christianity is not being a person with a heart of gold. Being a person with a heart of gold is great and we all hope that there are as many as possible. But that's not the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is this strange claim that God became one of us. Everything else in Christianity is a footnote. Hello and welcome back to this series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. Today I'm going to try and uh, talk about uh, Canto 7 of Paradiso. A canto I love, it's one of the very best cantos of Paradiso, one of the most wonderful, one of the most uh, heartfelt by Dante, and also one of the most difficult for us to understand because it's uh, very full of theology and it's not an easy side or an easy part of theology. So I don't feel fully adequate to talk about it. The best thing would be to have a professional theologian here with me to really have the full explanation, but uh, I'll do my best. So thank you for watching this video in advance. Canto 7 is the canto of uh, the Incarnation. So after having described all of uh, human history in the previous canto, in Canto 6, through the voice of Emperor Justinian, Dante now gets actually to the heart of the matter, to the essence of Christianity, which is the Incarnation, is the mystery of the Incarnation. And it's one of the two great mysteries that Dante tries to resolve, tries to, even Dante the character, tries to better understand, fully resolve um, in Paradiso, in the Cantica of Paradiso. One is incar the Incarnation and the other one is the Trinity. So with Incarnation, in Canto 7, he really gets to the bottom of it, and uh, in a very grandiose way, because after you know, following this history of man, as narrated by Justinian, we are now offered uh, almost uh, not only a history of the world as seen by God, through God's eyes, but uh, the entire view of uh, man's salvation through the Christian doctrine, and uh, uh, through the Incarnation, which is the central event in the Christian doctrine. Since the canto is quite complex, I think the best way to approach it is to start with a summary of uh, what we are facing, what the canto looks like from a high level, if we zoom out. And if we zoom out, canto 7 looks like a, a series of three main questions that come from Dante, even if Beatrice is reading his mind and she's the one expressing the questions. So the first question from Dante is about uh, the just vengeance. And the just vengeance, even if it was a proper juridical term in medieval times, uh, it's referred in this first part uh, to Christian theology. And it's referred particularly to what Dante has heard Justinian say in the previous canto. Justinian talked about a just vengeance um, that's been avenged. The just vengeance was uh, the vengeance of God, the wrath of God for uh, human sins in the um, death of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and then the second vengeance, or the avenged uh, vengeance, is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD by Emperor Titus, by the Roman Empire. Dante's question is, how do we reconcile this? How is it possible to have a vengeance that, that's divine, that's divinely ordered, of another vengeance that was just? How can we reconcile these two? So that's his first question. And in fact, he starts uh, on verse 19 of the canto. Then the second question, or second part of the canto, starts uh, at verse uh, 52. Dante is trying to go in deeper, uh, to go deeper, following the answer to his first question. And uh, he's trying to understand why, once he understands, uh, let's say, the difference and how to reconcile those two vengeances, why the salvation of man from God had to come in this peculiar way, why the Incarnation was the answer from God to man's uh, sinfulness and to man's problems. Why could God not maybe have done something else in his, in his powers? And that's really the 
center, the spiritual center of the canto, the most uh, pregnant, the most uh, difficult theological question of the entire canto, and it's not very easy to read it, not very easy to understand it. The third part, I believe, starts uh, towards the end of the canto at uh, verse number 121. And, uh, and so it's only the last uh, maybe 10 or 12 tercets, and uh, it has to do with uh, creation, and it has to do especially with the concept of uh, the resurrection of, of the body. So it may be at first sight, this third part looks like something that is not as well connected with the first and second part of the canto, but it actually is very much connected because it has to do with uh, the concept of or and the doctrine of resurrection, of the resurrection of the body that is uh, linked to the fact that uh, God took a human form and therefore entered the human flesh. So what is this uh, weird uh, first tercet? All in uh, different uh, languages. It's uh, a little bit in Latin, a little bit in uh, Hebrew language, and uh, it's, it reminds us of the first tercet of Canto 34 of Inferno, which was uh, uh, directed almost scornfully and sarcastically at Lucifer. Here is almost the opposite of that introduction of Canto 34 of Inferno. It goes, Osanna Sanctus Deus Sabaut, super lustrans claritate tua, felices ignes orum malacot. The meaning of this is Osanna is a celebration, exclamation of, of uh, joy and adoration. Sanctus Deo Sabbath, the uh, holy god of the armies. This is a Hebrew word, and uh, sorry if I mispronounce it. Super illustrans claritate tua. You give so much uh, splendor, you give so much splendor with your light to the blessed fires, felices ignes, orum malakoth, of this Kingdoms, I think, is the translation. And um, I read in a note that the correct word in Hebrew should be Malmakot, but I'll ask uh, my friend Ursula, who speaks Hebrew, to maybe help me and uh, correct me in the comments here. So it's an introduction that is a celebration, and it's an exclamation of joy that comes from uh, uh, Justinian, because this is the soul that has spoken in the... has just stopped speaking from the first canto, and is now singing, is now uh, dancing, in fact, because he starts moving and rotating with all the, the souls around him, and he will disappear in the distance. On this substance, Dante calls Justinian sustanza, or his soul, uh, the soul of Justinian, supra la qual doppio lume s'addua. Doppio lume means uh, double light, the light of the emperor, and the light of the blessed soul. So he's got a double light, saddua, which is a very weird verb, which uh, Mandelbaum translates as twinned, above whom double lights were twinned. Adua means uh, it, it becomes two, basically. Dante is expressing his doubts uh, internally, he is interiorizing his doubts, he's uh, looking down and uh, a little bit intimidated by Beatrice. And Beatrice, as always, she is smiling, she has a loving smile, probably stronger and more and more intense every canto. It's beautiful to see how much happiness and how, how much she is smiling throughout the entire Paradiso. At verse 17, Cominciò raggiandomi di un riso tal che nel fuoco faria l'uom felice. Uh, a man who is burning the fire would be still happy if he could see uh, Beatrice smile in that moment. Okay, let's, let's believe Dante. So here from verse 19, Beatrice starts uh, reading Dante's mind and heart and expresses his doubt, which is Come giusta vendetta giustamente punita fosse, time pensier miso. How is it possible that a just vengeance was punished with another vengeance? You are thinking about that, Dante. Listen to me, I'm going to explain this to you. And uh, this explanation uh, actually starts from Adam, <laughs> starts from the first man, the man who was never born. Uh, in his willpower, the man who was not born, that's what Mandelbaum says. So it's a very uh, long and deep explanation of uh, this question. But really, 
The sense is uh, to get at the deepest heart of the matter, uh, Beatrice needs to explain um, how God sees the nature of man. And it's important because all of our troubles, in a sense, come from Adam, from uh, his mistake, his uh, pride, his sin of pride, of not doing what was good for him, that was he, what he was told. It's, uh, in fact, uh, the original sin is a myth that exists in many different cultures, not only the Western culture. I think in some African ones as well, in some different uh, forms. And uh, it really encapsulates such a powerful wisdom, the wisdom that fundamentally we are a weird and really flawed being as human beings. We are made of uh, contrasting elements and uh, we are made of many contradictions. We constantly strive for something, but we never actually do it properly. We are able to imagine perfection, but we are extremely imperfect, all of us. So this is uh, perfectly summarized and perfectly narrated by the myth of uh, original sin and by the narration of Genesis. So Beatrice's answer is actually really synthetic, really brief, uh, compared to how deep the matter is. She tells Dante that, uh, in short, the punishment to Christ and the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was fully satisfying divine justice, because it was basically exchanging the, the endless value of the Son of God for the endless size of the offense made by Adam. So there was this level of comparable uh, value from uh, the greatness of Jesus and the greatness of the original sin. He was the only creature, the only human creature, because he was fully human, who could uh, reach that level. But he was also supremely unjust at the same time, unjust towards uh, Jesus, uh, because Jesus was also fully divine. And uh, as fully divine, uh, the Jewish people could not recognize him as such, and therefore uh, they were punished under this uh, divine justice system in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. So, on one hand, looking at the, these two punishments, these two vengeances, on one hand, the first one, that was directed against the humanity of Jesus. And the second one was uh, driven or spurred by the divinity of Jesus. Now we can understand how they can be reconciled and they can coexist. This explains why Beatrice says, Che a Dio e a Giudei piacque una morte. God and the Jews were pleased by one same death for different reasons. At this point, Dante can understand how to, to reconcile the expression used by Justinian, which was the just vengeance was then avenged by a just court. Now, the second part starts at verse 52, and the second part is, interestingly, a part where Dante takes from a little Augustine, a little bit of St. Thomas, but mainly from uh, another father of the church. His name is uh, Saint Anselm of Canterbury. In Italian we call this saint uh, Anselmo da Osta because that's where he was from in, in Italy, but then he became, I believe, Archbishop of uh, Canterbury. And he was a Benedictine monk, by the way. He wrote a, a book that was called uh, Cur Deus Homo, which means uh, why God became man. And uh, in this theological um, essay or theological book, he explained uh, theologically the basis of uh, a lot of what Christian, Christian doctrine uh, explains even today uh, of the reasons why uh, the Incarnation had to happen. And uh, Dante picks up a lot of, uh, of his main points. Something that I find personally really powerful, really profound and extremely wise here is this line. It's verse uh, 60, where Dante says, uh, Il cui ingegno nella fiamma d'amor non è adulto. It's a way for Beatrice to tell Dante, you will 
only understand this, anyone will understand this reasoning around the incarnation, only if you have learned how to love in an adult way, in a mature way. If you not only experienced love, but you've, you have the experience and the understanding of love from a, an adult and, and really mature way. So, as I said in the beginning, the center or the heart of this canto is this second part. And uh, the heart of this second part are these two tercets at uh, verse 97. 97 and uh, uh, until 103, where Dante says, uh, Non potea l'uomo ne termini suoi, mai soddisfar, etc. This is really the crux of the matter. But uh, because, as I mentioned, this is a pretty complex theology, I'm going to try and uh, paraphrase in general this second part and Beatrice's answer. In brief, let's try to summarize it. The size of the offense made by the creature to the Creator, made by Adam towards God, was so huge that it was impossible for a human being, a flawed human being, to atone it and atone for it, because we are not perfect. We as humans don't have that ability, we don't have that possibility. Therefore, as Dante says uh, at verse 91, there were only two possibilities or two options at that point. Either God was making, either God made uh, an act of uh, mercy and uh, forgiveness, almost like uh, drawing a line over a mistake, and uh, he could have done that with, and, and this is what Dante means. Um, in verse 91, where he says, uh, either through nothing other than his mercy, God had to pardon men, or of himself, men had to proffer payment for his folly. So on one hand, there was this potential ability to just uh, forgive men from a divine standpoint, from divine power point of view, or second option, God himself was going to intervene to satisfy, in a sense, uh, in the place of man. So, shedding his own blood for all the blood that man had been shedding until that moment. And out of these two options, God chose the second one. This, we cannot stop here. We, Dante cannot stop here. Dante needs to better understand why did God decide to do that. This is a question that many Theologians have been uh, asking and trying to answer century after century after century. Uh, we have an answer by St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, which is very interesting. I'm going to try and read it. And by the way, this is a question that many people find themselves asking even today. Um, online or friends, people, they're asking this question. Was the incarnation, the incarnation in itself, was it necessary? Did God have to do that? So, St. Thomas Aquinas, his famous answer to that, he said there are two types of necessity from a divine standpoint. There is one which is a strictness, something that cannot be avoided. And in that sense, no, that's not the necessity that we are talking about. It wasn't strictly necessary that God became one of us, because in his infinite power, God could have, like we were saying before, and like Dante is saying, drawn a line over man's mistake and uh, and saved us that way or some other way that we don't know or we don't understand. But then St. Thomas talks about a more kind of a loser sense of necessity and uh, he makes a, a great example. He says, uh, uh, it's not strictly necessary to take a horse if you're traveling from Paris to Rome, but in a certain sense it's necessary because it's the most uh, convenient or is the best way to travel. And so, this second kind of necessity that St. Thomas Aquinas identifies, in, under this light, the Incarnation was necessary because there was no more beautiful and no more compelling way for God to save us. Now, I'm going to read you a passage from uh, an Italian book by Franco Nembrini, who is a really wise uh, person, um, Catholic man, and uh, he's been reflecting upon this canto a lot. And he says this, he's a teacher as well. He says this, he says, uh, 
we immediately ask ourselves, why is Dante thinking this? Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been a much greater act, a sign of greater power, the omni-power of God, uh, to simply save us in a way that is final, with a, an intervention that would save us immediately, uh, without the need of, a, of a, something that uh, is dependent on human weakness? This is a very natural question to ask. And he says, uh, to explain this, I try to use a simple image. Let's think about our families. How easy it is to find parents who sacrifice themselves completely for the good of their children. Or better, for what they think is the good of their children. So, I love how he really hones in on the concept of education here. Because Christianity is not really about ethics, as we said before, but it's about becoming something. It's really, really about growing up, growing into something, becoming saints. So Franco Limbrini says, on one hand, it's really easy to find parents who think they're doing everything and sacrifice everything to, for the good of their, of their children, doing all those things for the good of their children. But it's much more difficult, actually, to sacrifice for your child, uh, for a child that acts in the way that he or she wants different from you and at the same time keep loving him or keep loving her even though she or him are going away from us they are distancing themselves from us and this is a good simile for god's love a love for a child that's man that is has turned his back on him a gratuitous love that doesn't depend on anything and that's the nature of it, that's pure, pure love. In fact, Nembrini continues, this type of parents sacrifice themselves because, for the purpose, specific purpose, of their children to be free, for their children to be free. And here we're touching on the concept, central concept of free will of man. The choice to trust human freedom is not only exalting the grandiosity and the greatness of God, but also the greatness of men, or at least the dignity of men, to assign and to admit, to recognize free will in men, it means to recognize the dignity of the human being, the potential in the human being of becoming a saint. And then finally, Nembrini uh, tells a story from his uh, classroom experience, and he says there's always some kids who asked him at this point, okay, but teacher, if God is so good and powerful as, uh, as you're saying, why doesn't he just uh, solve things uh, quickly? Uh, why doesn't he intervene and just eliminate evil from the world all of a sudden so that, um, you know, um, things are resolved that way? And Nembrini generally answers this question as, as follows. If God intervened to eradicate evil from the world, men would not be men anymore. And human being would not be a human being because simply he wouldn't be free anymore. He wouldn't have free will. We remember how central free will is in the Divine Comedy. Dante put it in Canto 16 of Purgatorio, between 16 or 17, wherever the center of the Divine Comedy is, the fulcrum of the entire Divine Comedy is free will. So in that case, a human being would not be free anymore could not do anything else but simply follow God uh, and nothing else, with no alternative. And at this point, Membrini says, somebody else is insisting, some other kids in his classroom insists. And they say, so, wouldn't it be better a world where even if we are not free, but nobody is committing evil and everybody is good, everybody is a good person? And uh, at that point, he as a teacher, answers, well, think about it. What do your parents uh, tell you about your uh, misgivings? Um, don't they tell you that you don't really appreciate the things that you have and uh, you don't give value, proper value, to the things that you have? And they say, yes, of course. And why don't you give value to the things that you have? And at a certain point, somebody who is maybe a little quicker than the other kids uh, gets the answer and he says, well, it's because we haven't deserved the, those things. We haven't achieved those things. We haven't 
conquered those things. So it doesn't matter how much we circle around it, but the point is that the crucial matter is freedom. Without freedom, there is no happiness, there is no salvation for human beings. So incarnation is the culmination of God's freedom and the foundation of the freedom of man, of our free will. Now I'm going to read a short passage from the Catechism of the Catholic Church about free will. Freedom is the power rooted in reason and will. God created man a rational being, conferring on him the dignity of a person who can initiate and control his own actions. The initiative comes from God, but it demands a free response from man. That roots responsibility, human responsibility. God has freely chosen to associate man with the work of his grace. The initiative in terms of grace belongs to God, but it's man who can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification to grow and become saints, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. On this very profound matter that uh, I am trying to articulate, I found a stunning, stunning poem by a poet called Charles Peguy. I think he lived in New Orleans, but I believe he was French. Charles Peguy, from his book The Mystery of the Innocent Saints. He is uh, articulating this point, I think, in a brilliant, brilliant, wonderful way. So I'm going to read a short portion of this poem. Such is the mystery of man's freedom, says God, and the mystery of my government towards him and towards his freedom. If I hold him up too much, he is no longer free, and if I don't hold him up sufficiently, I am endangering his salvation. He was making the example of a father who is trying to teach a child to swim in the river, and so in order to teach him to swim, he cannot hold him up, hold him up too much by the belly, because otherwise the child will never actually learn to sw how to swim. But he cannot either just not help him at all, because he's going to swallow the water and maybe even potentially drown. So there needs to be a balance between these two behaviors. So if I hold him up too much, he is no longer free. This is God talking about man. And if I don't hold him up sufficiently, I am endangering his salvation. So two goods, in a sense, almost equally precious. For salvation is of infinite price. But what kind of salvation would a salvation be that was not free? What would you call it? We want that salvation to be acquired by ourselves, ourselves, men, to be procured by ourselves, to come, in a sense, from ourselves. Such is the secret. Such is the mystery of man's freedom. Such is the price we set on man's freedom. Because I myself am free, says God, and I have created men in my own image and likeness. Such is the mystery, such the secret, such the price of all freedom. That freedom of that creature is the most beautiful reflection in this world of the Creator's freedom. I love this poem. It's so strong, so powerful. And uh, it talks precisely about what Dante is talking about in this second part, in the heart of the second part of the canto. To deny this freedom, to deny the existence of this free will, is to behave like Ulysses, is to behave like Ulysses in Inferno 26. We all remember that, and Dante remembers that. You know why? Because he repeats here the same rhymes of those famous tercets in Inferno 26, from verse 97 to 103, he is giving us one of his little hints to tell us, look, reader, I am referring you to Inferno 26 once again. Giuso, suso, and discuso. Verse per potere in giuso, ir suso, and discuso. These three rhymes are found exactly as they are in Inferno 26 as well. In other words, Ulysses, the symbol of human pride, the symbol of somebody who would deny the free will given by God, because he, Ulysses, is his own God, his own 
self is what really he is worshipping. There's nothing else. The third part of the canto starts at verse 121. And uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, easier to understand. And, but as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not as easy to understand why it connects to the first and second part. So let's try to understand that. If what God creates, like uh, Dante says in verse uh, 67 and 68 and 69, does not have an end, non ha poi fine, is eternal, it is endless, then why the four elements, fire, water, air, and, and uh, earth, are corruptible and uh, actually seem to have an end? Beatrice answers that immortality or eterna, uh, being eternal is a proper characteristic only of those creatures that God creates directly without an intermediary step and therefore only the angels, the, the heavens and uh, the raw material which is the human soul. So, and he, here is the Dante's argument which is very original, is not found, it was not found very often in, in his contemporary theology. If what God has created directly cannot die, so it's eternal, then also our flesh, our body, which is created by, by God, like scripture says, is by its own nature immortal. And therefore, uh, once the sin is being taken away, it's destined to resurrection. We get to resurrection, and this is uh, the point that Dante wants to get to. The final destiny of all the saved people is resurrection, which is an essential dogma of uh, Christian faith, and that is made possible only thanks to incarnation. Why? Because with incarnation, God took upon himself human flesh, and healed that wound that that sin had uh, caused, giving it a divine quality. We can see here how important, and we've seen throughout the entire Divine Comedy, how important for Dante is human dignity, the potential of uh, the human being, the distance that there is between, potentially, between a human being and an animal. Of course, there can be zero distance if we want, but thanks to free will we can put a huge distance between, thanks to free will and salvation, a huge distance between ourselves and the rest of the world, the rest of the earthly creatures. So here we are, this is uh, Canto 7 of Paradiso in a nutshell. As always Dante ends up uh, celebrating the greatest gift that God made to men, which is free will. and. Uh, he repeats it uh, in many different ways in the Divine Comedy so that he tries to hammer it into, into our head because it's so important. I, I hope you enjoyed this canto. I, I really think it's uh, one of the most wonderful of the, the, the entire Divine Comedy. I, I feel deeply for this canto because it resonates with my faith, of course, but uh, I'm curious to know how a canto like this, so filled with theology, sounds and reads to somebody who is not a religious person, who is not a faithful person. So please let me know and uh, thank you, thank you very much for watching.